the idea for this project grew very organically. Um, and hopefully it's something everyone's interested in and that we can get a lot of participation in across the island, uh, seeing as how uh, we are kind of like a unique geographic region. Uh, it's easy to put boundaries on something interesting like this. And I'll talk about what this is in a minute. Um, so the Bling Project, uh, the Biodiversity of Long Island Native Gardens, is going to use a program called uh, iNaturalist. Um, and I'll, I'll, some of you might be expert users in that already. Um, some people maybe have never heard it before. So I'll go through all the basics of it. I guess first and foremost, I kind of threw out there online, you know, why is everyone here? Um, most, uh, most people participating here um, probably saw me post this question. Uh, you know, why are you interested in native plants and in native landscaping? Uh, and the overwhelming response, and some people shared uh, their stories like uh, Deborah. Um, and at the end of the day, it all came down to like taking care of the earth and creatures people wanting to feed the bees and other creatures. Uh, we have Kevin down there, again, native bees and pollinators, okay? Uh, from uh, John to Jen to Melissa to Catherine, constant, the, 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 the reoccurring theme was always something about biodiversity, right? Um, and, you know, I, maybe it was kind of a loaded question. I kind of knew people were going to respond this way. And I'm glad they did, or else I would have messed up the beginning of this presentation. Um, but again, time and again, protecting the earth, uh, birds, bees, butterflies down here. Um, so I guess it led me to the question of, you know, what is the biodiversity uh, on the island, right? Um, we, we we say this, and for those that have been into native landscaping for a long time or or people that have just gotten into it, we say it, but have we ever tried to measure it? Have we ever really done what I think is the next logical step, which is really explore that biodiversity? So I wanted to introduce you to, to this little fellow, okay? This is a piece of biodiversity, um, and this kooky little thing uh, was in my backyard one day. And it's just so fascinating to look at. You know, we're always thinking birds, bees, butterflies, right? But there's so much more uh, out there. Um, and and this is one of them. And I, I like just how this thing stares at you. And it's, it's maybe no, no bigger than your uh, pinky nail. Looks like it's wearing a little witch hat, right? Um, so you see something like this, you, what is it, right? Well, it turns out it doesn't even have an English common name. It only is known by its uh, Latin name, which I'm not gonna try and do all the Latin here today, um, but it's a type of tree hopper, okay? Um, and it's really wildly different when you look at it from the side. This is the side point of view of it. Um, and it, you know, I kind of went down the rabbit hole with this. And I submitted my sighting to iNaturalist, okay? And there I am. Of all the people that have seen this creature, I'm the only one that's ever put it onto iNaturalist, which kind of means, uh, iNaturalist has been around for a little bit. Um, you know, it's not that I've, I'm the only person in New York that's ever seen it, but I'm the first one that, that that's uploaded it. and. Um, I think that's pretty interesting. And it raises a couple of thoughts to me. First off, that's pretty cool because that kind of constitutes like a record. Um, maybe there, maybe it has not ever been seen in New York before, uh, or maybe it's been seen uh, in parts upstate or the Southern tier. I know not the entire thing is upstate. Um, uh, upstate people get uh, a little bothered when you always lump them together like that. But per perhaps it's the first one on Long Island ever, right? Um, and I'm sure there's some literature someplace that could help define that. But I, I still think that's pretty cool that on this uh, on this uh, website, I'm the first one to submit this sighting. Okay. Um, some other questions would be, you know, some other thoughts. You know, why is it here? 
Um, is it here because of my yard, because of the surroundings, uh, because of what's been put back in place that hasn't been there uh, for the past decades or, or, or past century even? Okay. And another important question, like what else is here? You know, so again, we say birds, bees, butterflies, we all want to support biodiversity, but I think it's a real question mark. What is even the biodiversity of Long Island, right? Uh, from indigenous peoples to um, European uh, settlers for the past couple hundred years, have we, you know, we've touched every inch of it most likely, but have we really done a deep dive into the biodiversity that exists here? So um, who am I? I know Kim had that nice uh, uh, entrance for me. Um, well, my name on iNaturalist is Lamagswag. That's just something like my students came up with a couple of years ago um, and I just started using it as a username, okay? So that's who I am. I'm Lamagswag and on iNaturalist, you can make a profile. You don't have to, but um, that's who I am, right? I'm just a regular person that stumbled across this creature and reported it. And it happened to be the first report. And, and to me, that's very like empowering that anyone, a young uh, kid, you don't have to be a research scientist. You don't have to be a field biologist, right? You could just be a dad, a teacher, whatever, um, and be making important discoveries in your own backyard without bushwhacking through uh, the marsh or something like that. Um, so what is iNaturalist? What is that program that I've been using? Okay, oops, sorry. Um, it's a place where you can uh, upload sightings and observations, okay? It's a good, it's like a digital diary when it comes to biodiversity of all types, whether it's animals, uh, whether it's plants, whether it's um, uh, fungi, anything you can upload there, okay? Uh, it's a place, you know, from there, then you, it's a good jumping off place to uh, explore and learn more about biodiversity in your area using the maps. Uh, you could explore biodiversity all over the world. Um, so when I know I'm going to be traveling someplace, I could poke around and see what other users have seen in that area. It's a good place. Uh, your, your sightings contribute to citizen science, which has been a big deal lately, as especially with uh, the idea of sharing data. Um, actual research scientists cannot be everywhere all at once. Um, and more and more research papers are actually being, uh, some data from research papers is actually getting pulled from iNaturalist and from people's sightings. Uh, it is um, open source. Uh, you can interact with other people there. It's not necessarily a, um, a social network, but you have a username and you can message people and, and discuss with people, people that are professionals, people that might be in an area you're looking to visit or people um, that are friends of yours uh, that you could follow their sightings and things like that. Okay, you could participate in projects. That's kind of why we're all here. Uh, and, a, and a super important feature to me is that it's free, right? Um, it's not going to cost you anything. It's free to download the app. It's free to use it online. Uh, you could just sync it to a Google account or a Facebook account even. Um, there, I, I want to mention there is, uh, because this came up online earlier today, there is a more user-friendly uh, version by the same, by California Academy of Sciences and National Geographic called SEEK, S-E-E-K. Um, that is a, a streamlined version of iNaturalist, and it's more appropriate for children and it's compliant with all the federal um, rules about children online protecting their identities and locations and things like that. So if you have young children and you want to get into exploring biodiversity, um, I would recommend that as kind of an entry level for, for younger, younger folks out there. Okay. So um, that first tree hopper, how did I come across it? Or why did I come across it? Um, last summer, I had a goal. School ended, and I've been putting these plants in my yard. And just like everyone else that I that I highlighted in the beginning, I was interested in knowing: does my is my yard actually feeding biodiversity? 
So I set a simple goal for myself, which was to find at least one new organism per day over the summer. So from June 24th to September 1st for me, uh, in and around the native gardens of my property that can be ID'd to species or even subspecies, right? So not just it's a moth, but specifically what species a moth. And here uh, you can see uh, a number of different types of individuals, and I'm trying um, trying to include all sorts of different things that I found. But all of these, actually every picture in this presentation is from last summer in my yard uh, using an iPhone at that. Um, so from September 24th to, uh, I'm sorry, June 24th to September 1st, okay, um, every day I went out searching for something new in the garden and wake up, a uh, cup of coffee, walk around. That started to grow as I found more and more things and I was just hungry for more and more discovery. Uh, and so far to date, there was 284 unique species that I came across on a third of an acre, not including birds and also not including mammals. This is just insects and um, uh, one millipede. Um, and I say to date because there's some things I still don't know what their exact species is, and I'm still getting help IDing them and verifying their uh, identity. Um, but I thought that's pretty good in two months, uh, starting from zero, uh, 284 unique species found in my small patch. Okay. Um, so what did I find? Uh, you know, so the, the tree hopper noted was like a state record on iNaturalist. Well, it turns out a lot of them uh, were records. And again, this might be just uh, under, under reporting, um, but we're a pretty dense, count, uh, dense area on the planet. There's a lot of users out there. Um, and it just, every time there was a new first, it made me hungrier to go out and find new things. Uh, this unassuming moth <clears throat> actually made me kind of the most excited. Um, which is kind of interesting because it's kind of just so plain, right? The obscure Sarah moth, um, turns out it was a third state record. Talk, uh, discussed it with the, like the Long Island moth guy, Hugh McGinnis. Um, and that really fired me up to keep going out and, and finding something new, something new, something new. Um, and then I also was going out at night right? Uh, the, the, the lights that we're not supposed to have on, but, um, you know, we have our lights on uh, to the point where I went out and bought a UV bulb because that helps attract things like moths. And that's what I was really trying to find the most of. Um, but a lot of cool, fascinating creatures out at, at night also. And again, lots of state firsts and county firsts. Um, there's just so much out there. It's really, uh, incredible. It surpassed my expectations. <clears throat> so how do you use iNaturalist? So you might be uh, an expert on this already, but I wanted to give a brief tutorial um, on how to do it. So in iNaturalist, you take a picture or an audio, audio <laughs> recording of an organism or even evidence of an organism. So for instance, say if you were uh, upstate someplace and you saw gnawing at a tree and you're like, that's definitely a beaver, right? You could take a picture of that and submit that as evidence of the organism as well. Um, uh, you could use a camera, a real camera, a digital SLR, whatever, point and shoot, whatever you have, or you could use a smartphone. To me, the smartphones are a little bit more convenient because it automatically includes the location data. If you use a camera, you have to upload or you have to input the location data manually. Okay, um, And again, all the pictures on here in this presentation were actually just with uh, an iPhone, which I think is uh, pretty incredible. So if you're in the app across the bottom, you'll just click observe and then you'll get uh, this um, these buttons down here to, to select from, uh, or if you're on a desktop using the web page, you just use the big add observations button, right? Um, 
on the app and when similar to the the web page you'll be brought to this screen okay where you could then choose more photos or you could decide which photo is going to be the default like when someone pulls this up what's the first photo they see okay uh then then you're going to click what what did you see okay and it'll give you a list of suggestions <clears throat> now you can manually type in what you think you know you're looking at uh, but there's a pretty powerful algorithm that is analyzing the photo and giving you a list of suggestions down here okay um now the algorithm information is based off the photo that's provided and sometimes a different photo in different lighting or a different angle of the same organism might yield different suggestions okay um so it's based off what's in the picture it's also based off the location the picture was taken because there's probability so this is kind of an AI that's that's learning as more data gets submitted it will get better at recognizing what can what's expected to be found in that area okay and you could pick what you think is best okay or if you don't know what it is and you're like I just think this is a B you could type in B or wasp or whatever um and just leave it at that okay there's no pressure to get to the exact species um in fact I would always I would suggest that you always err on the side of caution. You don't want to give the algorithm bad data either. Okay. Hello. Um, so when using iNaturalist, okay, um, this is the only picture not from the yard. Um, when when using iNaturalist, uh, my my suggestion would to just always be curious, right? Just don't take a picture on a whim. Right. I really want everyone to feel the joy of kind of this biodiversity treasure hunt and really learn about what's what's out there. Um, and the algorithms always aren't perfect, right? The first choice isn't always accurate, right? So use your best judgment. Don't just rely on the computer uh, to give you the result. Okay. Uh, if you have your some time, it's not it's not a requirement, right? Do some research. Uh, look up the species information. Uh, compare to other sightings in the area, right? Um, and think about the setting and surroundings that you observed that creature in. Okay. So, for instance, I looked inside my uh, hibiscus, uh, the native Long Island hibiscus, right? And uh, there was a big bee in it. You guys have probably come across this. Um, and you know, in this case, the setting made sense. Well, what's it, what's the giant bee that's the giant type of bumblebee that's in my hibiscus? Well, it's the hibiscus turret bee, of course, right? Um, but maybe the algorithm would think that this is a carpenter bee, or maybe some of you even just thought that right off the bat that are more familiar with some of the more common species. Um, <clears throat> and on the right-hand side here, there's a type of sweat bee, okay? Um, bees, you know, one of those top three everyone mentioned, bees, butterflies, and birds, uh, bees are actually really difficult to ID. Um, you know, you're staring at it, you're a foot away from it, and it, they're still hard to, to, to decipher from, with an untrained eye. Um, but this guy was feeding on elderberry flowers, and it was, it was always there. So, you know, my, I went inside, and I was curious about it, and I was Googling uh, sweat where the the uh, the algorithm narrow was narrowing it down to sweat bee, you know. And then I said, "Well, which sweat bees feed from elderberry?" Uh, and uh, <clears throat> then I decided, you know, "Okay, it's a parallel striped sweat bee," and that was later confirmed to be accurate by some known experts on iNaturalist and and some other sites. I'll, I'll explain later. Um, you know, so some so a little deeper dive, some curiosity uh, helped me solve this puzzle a little bit. Okay. Um, a little more on that hibiscus turret bee. Uh, that was one of three sightings from Suffolk County. And this is something I would suspect is severely underreported, right? I'm in pretty dense suburb in Suffolk, not super dense, but uh, I'm surrounded by suburbia, not by inland wetlands that we would expect other hibiscus plants to be in. Um, so certainly something that's underreported. And again, a good indication as to why these observations are important, right? 
Uh, this is kind of a baseline. And in the future, in the next coming decade or two, if we start to see hibiscus terpenes um, further north, right, maybe that's indication of things like range expansion from climate change, right, that we know is happening with things like um, a southern pine bark beetle, right, moving up and kind of decimating our pitch pine forests, right. So that's an example of where some of this data might be really useful to a researcher. I'm just going to interrupt for one second. Yeah. Corey, can you put yourself on mute, please? I just can I put what? Put yourself on mute because it's interfering with the okay. sound. I'll shut it off. Thank you. Uh, if you do have uh, another another ask, um, there were some etiquette when using iNaturalist. Make sure if you have an observation that all the pictures in the observation are of the same individual. Okay. Uh, that's really important. And iNaturalist is specifically for wild individuals. Yes, your dog is adorable. Yes, your cat is wonderful. Um, but they're not wild individuals. Um, so keep it to keep it to wild uh, specimens. Um, not all IDs need to be down to exact species, as I mentioned. Um, some things are impossible to identify exactly without dissection. Uh, looking at their reproductive parts. Um, we still don't know what separates some species. And, you know, maybe through all this, you discover something new, right? That's a possibility as well. Uh, so some things that I found in the yard that I couldn't get ID'd exactly, uh, like this caterpillar was on a host plant and there's still, there's thousands of moths on Long Island. Uh, moth species, you know, I would have to leave it at the family level, not even the genus in this case. Okay. Um, again, bees are actually really difficult to identify. And I really wanted to know what this guy was. I, I thought this picture would be really good. It had the hind leg. I had the cells of the wing. Um, still, I'm stuck at genus with this, with this one. Uh, so bees are really, so that's probably what a lot of people are interested in. Um, it, it's actually kind of difficult to get it down to to exact, but they're still beautiful and they're worth taking pictures of. I'll tell you that. Um, these leaf hopper guys became a quick favorite at night. So many interesting colors. They're they're so tiny. Um, you think something like this would be so unique that I would get the answer, but um, it cannot be positively ID'd um, past the genus here. Uh, has to be left at that. Okay. Um, people who help identify your observations can be wrong. Okay. So don't feel like you need to agree with everyone. In fact, some of the most professional people on iNaturalist, people with PhDs who they've dedicated their life to one particular beetle, um, they'll say in their profile, like, I could be wrong sometimes, right? I'm, I'm only human also. Um, so the, like the most humble people are the ones that say like, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but certainly the people out there are generally are extremely helpful. Um, and that being said, don't, you'll see when, as you upload information, there are top, uh, top identifiers for what you're looking at. Um, you don't want to pester those people um, and fill up their inbox with people asking, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? People dedicate their time to going through observations that are uploaded to verify them. Uh, or not, um, it'll happen, okay? Uh, again, I actually had to update this because I went from 283 to 284 a couple days ago. So someone finally saw an observation from July and said, yeah, that's what it is. Uh, and that that led me to a level of confidence that uh, I, I thought it was exact also. Um, so check people's profiles if they're open to being added at Right. So if you did at symbol Lamag swag, then you could type some a message to me through iNaturalist. Okay. So that's a brief overview of iNaturalist. Okay. So sorry if you already knew how to do that and you're kind of uh, bored by that. Um, but that leads us to here, right? This leads us to the, the whole uh, cell of you guys coming to this webinar, right? What about if we all used it. 
all of us that have dedicated time and money and have been on our hands and knees in December because the ground wasn't frozen yet. We're like, we're still going to plan something uh, or or I, I still have all this stuff lined up in my driveway. I got to get in the ground before my wife yells at me. Um, you know, what about if we all used it? And can we then collectively gauge the positive impacts of our native gardens and landscapes, right? And some of the most, um, and, and the reason why I wrote that course at the high school, right? This is a really empowering movement, restore, uh, restoration ecology. Um, so what about if we all come together? Uh, can we measure this? Yeah, right? Using iNaturalist, we can get this done. Okay. So this brings us to the project, right? Using iNaturalist, I would like to introduce and invite everyone to the Biodiversity of Long Island Native Gardens iNaturalist project. Okay. So a feature in iNaturalist is that there are projects where we can collect data. So I'm a user on it. You will be a user on it. Kim's a user on it now, um, where we can now collect our data. Okay, It's a spot for us to share sightings, share the data, and highlight the positive impacts on of our biodiversity that we're seeing. Right. So whether it uh, walks, flies, crawls, or anything in between, it's a spot for you to share it with other people on Long Island. And by Long Island, I mean all of Long Island, because some of my friends, uh, Chris and Carl, would be very upset if I left out uh, Kings and Queens counties. So we mean the entire geographic uh, range from Long Island City to Montauk and, and Orient and everything in between and everything up and down, right? Um, what are the goals, okay? Remember the original question is like, what else is here, right? Can we establish a baseline of what biodiversity is on Long Island, but not just on Long Island, the ones that could actually survive in our suburban urban landscapes, right? What are the ones that we are perhaps helping uh, hold on uh, that, or that we are restoring a, a breeding locations or feeding locations or whatever it might be? And can we inform best practices for native gardening and landscaping. Which species have the most impacts, right? If we've read Talmy and, and other authors, we know things like oaks and willows and cherries are the most important trees uh, for perennials, things in the Asteraceae family, right? Um, but what else, you know, what, what, or maybe that's for, we have good data for uh, Lepidoptera, moths and butterflies, but what about the beetles? What about the birds themselves? Um, what about the bees, right? Uh, can we set up some best practices for some really high impact landscaping for those that are for those of us that are interested specifically in su in supporting biodiversity? Okay. Can we educate the public on wild creatures instead of just saying uh, the public and ourselves instead of just saying birds, bees, butterflies? Can we be specific? The yellow horn flower, uh, the yellow horn flower, longhorn beetle. What a name. Um, can we enhance the knowledge of those specialized relationships in nature? So again, we're most of us are familiar with the specialized relationships between caterpillars and their host plant, uh, bees and their and, and flowers. Um, are there other specialized relationships, or are there relationships we just don't know about yet? Right? Because the more I went through this last summer, the more I learned what we, the more I learned that we just don't know everything. There's still a lot of questions out there. And through this project, can we be, we can be contributing data for other researchers? Uh, remember, uh, there have been actual research papers based off data from iNaturalist, right? So we can be contributing to that, especially on a, a unique geographic uh, location, such as Long Island, okay? so. 
how do you join Bling? Well, you first search for it in iNaturalist, okay? Um, and then you're gonna click about, okay? From there, you're just gonna click join this project on the top right of the screen, okay? That'll bring you to the some terms here, okay? I'll go over the rules in a second and just click, yes, I want to join, okay? Uh, and it's very similar on an app, okay? So if you have the app open, in the bottom right, there's projects. Same thing, you just search for it. And then a list will come up. Then you just click the bling and then you just click join. Uh, on the app, there is no terms page. And that's it, then you're in. So for this project, what exactly do we want to gather, okay? We only want observations from private residential land, not observations that you see in the park, not observations that you see at your office building or school, right? Um, or on a, or a walk around your neighborhood. We, we want specifically private residential land in and around native gardens or native landscapes. Okay, because the whole idea is, is our work and time benefiting the biodiversity here at home? Some of you maybe have larger pieces of property with wooded areas. Great, include that, right? You are stewarding that area. Uh, you are keeping uh, the red maples there and preventing it from being taken over by uh, Atlantis or, or Tree of Heaven, right? Great. We'll include that in private land, right? Um, if you want to make observations at night, great, uh, on your private land. Um, so you're not going to be like in your garden necessarily, but looking at your lights uh, on your front porch or back or, or back step or something like that, okay? Keep in mind, this is for wild organisms only, okay? Um, and we're only after animals, okay? Insects, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. Um, I included a mammal here, okay? That's great. I'm sure a lot of you have deer, uh, rabbits, uh, skunks have been around a lot lately. Um, add those, okay? The presentation, and when I was at home I foc uh, last summer, I focused mostly just on insects, uh, but include everything, right? Frogs, um, anything you come across on your property, right? They're all part of the food chain that your garden could be supporting, okay? Um, so we're animals only, that's, uh, and the, the project will only allow you to upload animals. No plants, because it'd be too hard for us to separate what was something you bought and planted versus something that would appear naturally. Uh, no fungi, sorry, uh, no protists, nothing like that. We'll just stick to animals for right now. Okay. If you can, when you add an observation uh, and the organism is interacting with uh, a native plant uh, or using it or feeding from it in some way, you can include that in the notes, right? This is part of the best practices part. Um, that way, if I'm looking through the project or you're looking through the project and you're like, oh, that's a cool butterfly, um, I want to have that in my yard. And someone has the information in there, like it's feeding on New York Ass, you're like, oh, I got to go buy some of that. Um, or, or, in, or for someone that's more interested in um, looking at this from a research point of view, can we collect data like that um, at some point? Okay. The thing about the project is you have to manually add observations to bling, okay? This is the only way for us to control it being specifically on private land, okay? If you're an iNaturalist user already and you've contributed to other projects, other projects automatically scoop up the data that they're looking for because they don't care about the type of land use, okay? We are trying to specifically control for the type of land use, so you have to add manually to it. A lot of cool guys on this screen here. Um, this mantid fly, right? It looks like a praying mantis. Um, it is, it's a fly, it's a, it's a, it's a, a dytera. Um, uh, ambush bug, right? This guy looks like a little prehistoric 
reptile almost uh, also kind of has that um, that feeding mechanism uh, of, of snatching prey. You just kind of see it waiting for a pollinator to come to that flower. Um, want these two in the act. Um, a little note here, catching the face of bees and wasps, it goes a long way in helping you identify them. Okay, so um, you have to manually upload things to the Bling project. Okay, so how do you do that? Okay, uh, at, when you're in the process of adding the observation, you could go uh, on the app, you could click projects, okay, that will bring you to this screen and you just turn on the green toggle, okay, it will be gray at first, so you just click that, it'll move over to green, and now it will contribute, okay, there is a note there, it says observations will be automatically included in a collection project if they meet its requirements, if you look here, we are a traditional project, not a collection project. So regardless of the, despite the note, nothing will ever automatically go into the project. You have to do it manually. Okay. On a computer, the same thing. Uh, in this case, I already have submitted this observation. So if I wanted to add it to the project, okay. Uh, well, projects are on the right hand side of the screen down towards the bottom there. Okay. All I would do is then search, click, uh, and add, okay? Now, for a lot of us, uh, the, the point of the project is that this will be done at your home, right? Where you're doing the native landscaping. Um, if you have privacy concerns, iNaturalist actually has a feature for that. Um, again, during the uploading process, you could click geo privacy, which will then bring you to this screen and you could, you could select obscured or private. Uh, what obscured does is it puts the dot um, randomly inside of some sort of bounding box, right? So this particular blue observation right here uh, took place somewhere in this box, right? So there is no way to narrow down where the exact location was, okay? Um, a great feature of iNaturalist is that it helps to protect threatened and endangered species, especially from poaching. Um, so if you have a very unique observation from some, or something that's endangered, uh, it will automatically be obscured. No other user can know the exact coordinates unless you tell them. Uh, this map is actually for box turtles, um, which are a threatened species here in New York on Long Island. Um, so there's no exact location of where these box turtle sightings were seen, right? So you can see that there, some of these dots are in the sound, right? It obviously wasn't seen there. It was somewhere within this artificial bounding box that was created. Okay. Uh, what about invasive species? Okay. If it's an invasive species, it'll get that, uh, after you submit it, it'll get that uh, pink uh, exclamation point, okay? Um, we're going to add them, right? Their distribution and range is just as important to understand and collect data on as our native species. Um, and you don't know what's native or not native necessarily, right? Um, this guy in the bottom right here, this metallic bluish green cuckoo wasp, when I saw it crawling around, I was like, oh, that thing's awesome. I got to get a picture of it. Uh, and then I uploaded it and I did some research. I was, ah, oh, I was kind of bummed that this one is actually not native to uh, North America. It's an Asian species. Um, or these cool underwing moths, uh, this this cool uh, moth also. Um, it's best to upload it. I would also uh, I would also ask that you don't kill them because you might upload it and go, oh, it's an invasive or it's a non-native species, and then go outside and stomp on it. But then a week later, somebody like, no, it's actually this, right? So it's best to err on the side of caution. Uh, that being said, if you see a spider and lantern fly, you can um, you can stop that one. Um, so just err on the side of caution, please. You don't want to accidentally kill something uh, because an, a, the algorithm told you it was uh, non-native. Okay. Um, as the project goes on, you could you could check how it's doing uh, by going under the community tab, clicking Bling, uh, or on the app. 
again, in that bottom right corner, clicking projects, uh, and then that will come up that you're a part of it. And you could click there and you could see what people have been seeing. Okay. There are lots of cool other projects all over the place. Currently, there is a project hosted by SeaTuck uh, collecting the distribution of mammals on Long Island. Uh, again, uh, Kings, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk are included in there. Um, and this is a, a different type of project. If you take a picture of a mammal, you will see that it automatically got added to this project for you. Um, so this is really important. I encourage people to uh, contribute to this. Um, hopefully there are some other teachers from other schools around here, around the island. Um, I would love to do a school-based bling version. Um, blings, plural, S for schools. I'm trying to come up with another acronym. Um, so hopefully there's some people that might be interested in this and as I have a very supportive uh, administration and, uh, and, and colleagues that we've been doing native gardening at uh, the high school. Um, I would love to partner with other schools, again, cross the island uh, and collect similar types of data. Okay. There's plenty of other resources out there if you're interested in citizen science projects. Um, there's eBird, which is a very famous one that a lot of birders use. There's Bumblebee Watch. I, don't, I haven't really used that one too much. There's Bug Guide. Uh, that's a great place to help with. You could submit uh, sightings on there also to get confirmation. And there's the Butterflies and Moths of North America. Uh, again, you could also submit data to this as well uh, and get confirmation that way. So there's lots of ways. If you're really curious as to what something is, there's lots of ways to submit your, your sightings to see uh, what it might be. Um, and that's it. So uh, spread the word. Anyone could participate. Um, I hope to maybe be back with Rewild in a year, perhaps, and get our first year's worth of findings. Um, and thank you, and keep doing what you're doing. Um, and hopefully we'll find some really cool stuff. Uh, I hope people get really excited about this. Uh, and collectively, we can we could change the world, really. Um, so I hope you're inspired to get out there and start searching. Um, Kim, do we have time for questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you want to just, well, actually we don't, yeah, we can do that. So I'll, anybody um, have any questions? I'll stop sharing. There, there are already some questions in the yep. um, chat. chat. So Don Wu asked, do you need to wait for your observation to become research grade to add to Bling? And no. can you add past observations or is this project only for 2023? So um, I originally named it 2023, then I stopped it. I would say maybe we can start, like start now. And I don't see a reason to ever stop the project, right? So I would say maybe from this point, so I don't, I personally don't plan on adding stuff from last summer. So maybe from this point forward, people can submit their observations in their yard, private locations. And it does not have to be research grade, which means someone else has verified it, um, as long as it's not casual. It has to ha at least have a photo or an audio recording. It could also just be a picture of evidence. So um, say a bald-faced hornet's nest in a tree on your property. You could take a picture of that and that would that would count. Yeah. Um, and to Joanne clarify that this is specifically for private home gardens, is it? Yes, um, that's we, what we, we want to focus on, right? Great, so great. Because there are some naturalist centers who are doing their own who are asking, you know, do we combine or what or or this is just private home gardens. Yeah, we want to focus on and and empower homeowners, right? I'm a nobody who is finding state records on a third of an acre in Suffolk County, right? Um, and I think it's cool to give homeowners the opportunity that they've been investing time and money and in, in planting in their yards and changing their landscapes. Um, and let, let's kind of celebrate all of us as individuals. Yeah, the, what the nature centers and other places are doing is also wonderful. Um, what the support I've had at school is wonderful. Um, 
so maybe those are separate projects in the future. Okay, um, Joanne Strongen, she would like to know how to get a photo into the app on a laptop and how do you discern expert from average non-professional user? Um, <laughs> if you have a photo, you can upload it using the app or on your desktop, right? So if the photo is in your Google Photos, for instance, um, or on a flash card, right? You could download it onto your desktop and just upload it using the web page, not the app, right? So you could use the app or the web page or, or, or a combination of both. Um, and then an expert user, meaning someone that's just more knowledgeable. Um, if someone verifies an observation that I know is a difficult species, I, I might click on their profile and read it and says, you know, I'm a, I'm a researcher at this location in the rainforest and I specialize in, in plant bugs, whatever it is. Um, yeah, but not everyone has that and you'll, you'll get an idea really fast. So some people that, that do this every night, there's one guy, Brandon Wu, if you upload um, a cicada, uh, I'm sorry, a, a Katie did or a grasshopper, he will be on it that day verifying your observation. You'll 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 see some names pretty frequently. And but I wouldn't trust about that, right? Again, people could be wrong. Um, so th that's not necessarily the name of the game. I think you answered this already with the little the adorable little Asian bee. Um, are you interested in people adding both native and non-native discoveries to bling? Yeah. So yeah. So the answer to that was yes. Again, because a lot of us might not know um, what's what. And again, I like I was totally bummed out by that cuckoo bee. Um, some of the moths are have surprising histories. Um, they're uh, one that a lot of you will probably come across as the Atlantis moth. Uh, it actually doesn't exclusively feed on tree of heaven it's from florida but that invasive tree being brought here has expanded its range north so there's a lot it's still native to north america so it's not native to, to the northeast um, so there's a lot of interesting stories out there that will unfold as you make more observations um amy olander just wanted to know if you remember the Tux project name offhand <laughs> uh, long island mammals that's it yeah. Just and again, if you mind. upload a picture of a mammal, it will automatic. you don't even have to join the project. It will automatically grab the data. So you take a picture. Oh, yeah, of, really? Yeah, you take a picture of a squirrel in your yard. Um, it will automatically get submitted to that. Um, this is the question that I've always asked you, and this is where I got the little uh, focus lens from. Any tips for taking such great focus in focus pictures of little guys on a flower nodding in the wind? <laughs> um, yeah, so all the photos were from my yard using an iPhone. Um, now I did eventually buy like a, a clip that helped the camera become like a macro lens. It was $20 and now I travel with it. Um, it's it's really great. I didn't want to add that here because I didn't want it to be a, a, a webinar about photography. Um, and some of you are probably way better photographers than I am. There's one woman in Satoka, I was kind of hoping she would be here tonight, who takes just mind blowing pictures um, of insects in her yard. And um, so hopefully one of you could teach me how to do it better. But yeah, it takes a took some practice, but you'll 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 figure it out. That's part of the fun. And it doesn't Absolutely. always have to, it doesn't have to be crystal clear to get a positive ID either, right? That, that's what I like about all of this. You don't have to be an expert photographer. You don't have to be an expert identifier. You don't have to be a field researcher, right? You could just be me, a, a guy who has a little bit of interest um, and trying to learn more. That's it. Nice. I love it. I think it's great. Um, I finally started playing with it because I, as most people know who know me, I'm obsessed with insects myself. Um, I think it's great. It takes a little getting used to, um, but once you get get it down, it's actually pretty easy. Um, I and naturalist. I also, I'm about. Yeah, I naturalist. It's it's yeah. it's pretty easy. Like I said, yeah, when I first there's went a... on, I was like, what? 
Yeah, there is a tremendous amount of features on iNaturalist. If you really wanted to start putting together some of your own data or um, make some of your own lists or really get into taxonomy, it's a really great jumping off point. It might be a little clunky at first, but you'll get the hang of it. I actually prefer the app. I prefer the app for my observations. I like the desktop better for exploring. Um, you know, there might be, um, I've been kind of into ants lately. I don't know why. Uh, so like, so you, on the desktop, I can look on Long Island and just search by ants to see what species are even around and get an idea where they might be to go to go find them. Um, I see some questions in the chat about the clip. I don't want to sound like I'm, um, I've only tried I one. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I don't I don't want to uh I don't want to make any recommendations because I didn't I didn't try like seven. I like bought one and I stuck with it. Yeah, I bought the same one, so I just put that in there so people okay. if they want to check it out, they can. Um anybody Anything else have else? any more questions? Can, yes. Can... Um can you add multiple shots of the same um insect so it's sort of condensed in one file so you might get a better idea of yeah, so I will, um, I'll reshare here, right? So here's uh, all of my observations ever, okay? Um, so for me, I could, I could filter it just to give you a real example here. Um, so something that I saw in the yard, I saw this chickweed, geometer moth and I typically take more nice. I just have to take one picture of that one <laughs> um I typically always take multiple photos from different angles uh because I'm I me personally I'm pretty obsessive so here you could see this saddled leaf hopper that I saw last summer in the yard um and I took different angled shots of it and that's how it would look on the website so when I'm uploading it I could continuously add photos um I know that there were some I was very obsessive about because I just knew I needed many, uh, many angles. I, I know this guy was in the presentation, but I probably took multiple photos of that guy too. Um, yeah, trying to get the face, trying to get the legs. Yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll get the hang of it. Um, you know, if you get really into it, you'll know what to look for uh, over time. Um, if you're on the Long Island Native Gardening Facebook page, you know, I posted about this guy over the summer. It's a mosquito that the larva eat other mosquitoes. Very cool individual, right? So oh, different so photos, cool. close up, far away um, on common bone set. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. You could come I will tell everybody, it's addictive. <laughs> it really is. Any other questions, anybody? Anyone? Are there times of day that it's better to look for insects, or is it all throughout the day, or 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 is it warmer, sunnier? What happens? Everything's so different, right? So I found I found pretty much all all times of day. I um I'm trying to remember. I didn't really mentally keep track of that, but you know I was going out at night also. Uh, so when the sun went down, I would turn on the UV light. Uh, so if you want to get into mothing or those nighttime creatures, there's plenty of websites on how to do that. You just hang up a sheet or if you know a, a light um, where things come to. Um, but yeah, during uh, any time during the day, if I wouldn't get something right in the morning that I became really obsessive, right? Because my goal was every day I was home to get at least one thing different that I haven't seen any of the other days. Um, so if you keep looking, you go flip rocks over. If you have some, hopefully you have some like a uh, uh, native, uh, um, uh, some logs or something, right? There's stuff living in there. If you wanna, if you wanna add crustaceans to your list, right? The pill bugs, those are crustaceans. They're pretty much all not native, actually. That blew my mind when I learned that. Um, anything else? The... Anybody else? Oh, jo Joanne? You just mentioned Long Island Native Gardening website. Is that? Uh, is no, that... The, face, the Facebook group, I think. 
Oh, the, it's a Facebook. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, hopefully um, people are going to join it and submit their sightings um, and get into it and, and most importantly, spread the word, right? The more people, the more discoveries we're going to collectively make and the bigger this project will become. And hopefully then we could share it with other counties, other regions throughout the country, throughout the world um, to show the impact, the positive impact that we're actually creating right? That we're not just doing something, we're just telling ourselves that this is great and patting ourselves on the back for no reason. We can measure the, the positive impact we're, we're, we're making. All right. Nice. Anybody else? As someone said, what about house bugs? Um, I would say in and around native gardens, right? So maybe more outside things, like not a silverfish, perhaps, unless you find it outside, that'd be interesting. That'd be cool. <laughs> All right, I'll, ha I'll hang out, but thanks. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm willing to share more presentations with Autobahn societies and things like that. Um, nice. So feel free to reach out. And again, if there's teachers on here, please contact me uh, either through iNaturalist or email or anything uh, to think about building this as a program with schools uh, K through 12 throughout the island. Absolutely. Kim, Absolutely. would you put David's email in there again, or David, would you put your email into the chat again? Sure. Hi, Randy. No, not just insects. I focus on that, but uh, birds. Um, I, I did have, I did put the bunny in there. Um, squirrels, <laughs> deer, yeah, anything. Just as long as it's in, in the kingdom animalia, right? Well, thank you, David. That is amazing. Like I said, I'm having a blast with it already. So like I said, it becomes very addicting and it's just, it's a lot of fun. It's a great program and I, I look forward to seeing our year review next year. Um, I just want to remind everybody on March 22nd, we have Mina Vicera from Cornell Cooperative Extension um, talking about all the resources they have there from 4-H club to um, nutritional information to gardening. So um, like I said, they're a great uh, resource. We have Anthony Marinello from Drop Seed Native Landscapes, and he is the um, admin for um, the Long Island Native Plant Gardening Group on Facebook. Um, so that's, you can find him there. And he's going to answer um, our how to maintain your spring garden question. And again, we have that plant sale coming up and we'll be sending that out shortly. So thank you again, everybody. That was fantastic. And we're happy everybody joined. That was, that was wonderful. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> thank you. Good night.